In the old days, you'd, you'd start in ERP, and then you'd go into Excel, and then you'd go into Access, and then you'd go somewhere else. So really having everything in one place, uh, one set of the truth, data, data, that's the truth, right? Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. We're getting technical today. I got Paul Tedford, CEO of Synergy Resources. Paul, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Ari. Paul, I'm excited to talk about this. There's been a lot of conversations for many, many years about technology manufacturing. ERP, clearly one of them. And I know we've got a lot, to, a lot of wood to chop in that yeah. area and some, some surrounding topics. But before we get to that, we got to start off with the Made in America questions, my friend. What do you make and why do you make it? We make successful ERP implementations, or I like to say happy customers with ERP, because as you know, not every customer that has an ERP is happy with their ERP. <laughs> so we, we like to make happy ERP customers, and we do that by providing truly meaningful and impactful results around price, delivery, quality, and technology for our customers. That's pretty cool. And why do you guys do it? We love manufacturing. So uh, from the last, we've been in business for about 27 years, and we love working with people that are in manufacturing, the challenges that manufacturing brings that are unique um, in the ERP mar market, so for example, distribution companies, they don't have routings and they don't have co as many costing requirements and scheduling. So we just love those challenges. I personally and our company thinks that manufacturing is the heartbeat of the, the U.S. economy. And um, just being part of that is a, is a great mission for us to have. So plus we love technology. We <laughs> love software. We love implementing it. And uh, we like doing creative and innovative things with it for our customers. So that's why. Those are, those are some, those are some pretty good, strong yes. whys. Um, yeah. So let's just kind of dig into a little bit of your your background um, before we sort of get into some of the more technical stuff. And I, and I know we're going to get into some weedsy stuff, but I think people that have been in manufacturing for a while know how important you know this mm -hmm. this topic is. And you said make happy ERP customers. There's probably a lot of people listening that are like, is that is that a possibility? Does that <laughs> right. actually happen? So we'll get to that. So just talk about yourself, Paul. How did you kind of get you know into this business? You mentioned your passion for manufacturing, mm -hmm. so it's kind of dig into your history and how you got that. Right. So I was a student at UNH, University of New Hampshire, back in age myself, 1994. So uh, I had to put myself through college. So I had to get a couple jobs during school and during the summer. So I actually worked for two manufacturing companies. One was a in-ground pool th designer. So they'd take gunite pools, which are the cement pools that can crack, and they'd retrofit them into vinyl pool liners. Um, and they built a custom ERP because at the time there was no cloud-based ERPs and there was no, there were Mac House and Apple House at the time, 20 plus years ago. There was no ERPs built for that. So we built a custom one that was really exciting to work on. Um, and then during um, the summer and the winter when school wasn't in session, I worked for my dad's company who worked in Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, Eagle Can Company, later Milton Can Company. Later, they went out of business because that work went to China. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they um, were getting their second ERP system, which came on those true floppy drives, <laughs> that five and a quarter inch disks. And uh, they said, can you help us try to figure this out? So we, on the huge mainframes, we, I helped implement it. I didn't know like the financial part at the time or anything like that, but I got the technical part working with them. I just fell in love with, with manufacturing. So fast forward. After college, I, I found an ERP system, Lily Software, in uh, Hampton, New Hampshire. Started working for them in tech support, went into product management, left them and went to an antivirus company, which you might know, Sophos, yeah, out sure. of Linfield. And then the owner of Synergy called me up and said, why don't you come back and help us do software demos, data migration, and, and things of that nature. So for the last, I'd say about 18 years, I've been working for Synergy in almost every role you can imagine, uh, data migrations, as I mentioned, um, doing product demonstrations, doing some operational implementations, part of an implementation team, report writing, things of that nature. Uh, moved into pre-sales, um, VP of sales, and two and a half years ago, our owner basically said, I really would love to be in an RV with my wife more often <laughs> and, and seeing everything around the country, which is awesome for him. He's a great, really, really great guy. Um, and he said, hey, you up for it? And I said, sure, let's, uh, 
let's grow the company and make more manufacturers happy. There you so, go. And so, so yeah. the, and so a new CEO was born. <laughs> That's right. That's great. Yeah. So you've yeah. really, I mean, despite not sort of having founded the company, you really have been through all different aspects. So really from the ground up, starting and just sort of like really tech support and customer service, yep. you know, through the ranks, uh, all the way up to see from a different perspective, huh? Absolutely. When we when I started, there was probably about eight people in the company. Now there's like 128. <laughs> so quite a bit of growth over the last 18 years. And same with customers. We probably had about a couple hundred customers. Now we have about almost 1,400 uh, customers. So it's been a, a very exciting and a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. That's great yep. to be a part of. Um, so let's kind of dig into the main core of it, which is this like kind of ERP integration. And mm -hmm. I, I think our listeners are going to get a lot of value out of this. So, I mean, I think most people know, but we do have some people that maybe aren't direct in manufacturing. So maybe you could just start off by giving us a quick primer, like what does ERP stand for and, and why are they why is it important to have that if you're in manufacturing? Sure. So ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. Um, back in the old days when IBM started it in the 60s. It was called MRP at the time, where it was just looking at your um, demand and supply and telling you what parts you should purchase and make, right? And over time, it added things like finance to it, scheduling, supply chain, um, bill of material, writing control, obviously, um, and other tools like sales order entry, CRM. So anything that a manufacturing company needs, it's basically one software system so companies can be more efficient and the three main areas are now nowadays is four, but typically they buy an ERP or implement an ERP to improve price and costing visibility or costing visibility so they can set the prices and make sure they're making the right margins on all products, just not a few products, right? Which products are winners and losers? You got delivery, so being able to deliver on time, um, whether it's getting the material on time or looking at capacity planning, you know, this week, but also we're gonna be in trouble months from now so we can buy a new machine or hire or train people up or get temps. Um, so delivery is important, then quality and compliance. And then also reporting and in, in technology. So we're seeing a lot of people that, you know, want to do more out of one work surface. I call it a work surface because in the old days you'd you'd start in ERP and then you'd go into Excel and then you go into Access and then you go somewhere else. So really having everything in one place, uh, one set of the truth data data. That's the truth, right? So, I mean, so at the core of it, if I like strip it all away, the goal is to have some software that helps me run my business better, right? That, I mean, that's that's, right, that's the that's sort of at the at the at the base of it. And anyone yeah. who's been in any business, manufacturing or otherwise, knows every time you try and look to improve your business, it's a it's a multivariant problem, right? It's, there's right. not generally not one lever that you can you can pull because everything's connected to everything else. So this ERP allows us to sort of look at everything from a holistic perspective, to your point, price, delivery, quality, mm -hmm. and then the reporting, sort of the data out, right? That's yep. really what we're looking at. You have at. all that data in one place, and now you can create the KPIs you want to to get to set your goals and, and grow your company, right? Yep. So you've been in this for a long time, you know, since the mid-90s, I guess, and mm -hmm. it really comes down to it. So what's changed in ERP over the last like almost 30 years? Well, quite a bit. So when back in the IBM days, we were talking about people made one thing, right? They made, make the stock items. And then remember the Burger King commercial, have it your way. Yeah, I remember course. that. So again, aging myself, but that have it your way went throughout manufacturing. Like I want this, but I want it this color. I want this, I want it this size with these dimensions. So the way MRP was developed in the beginning, it was built for make to stock repetitive manufacturing. The US really is more engineer to order, make to order, configure to order these days. So um, ERPs had to change to support that. So it's it's more flexible um, and there's a lot of features, which I'm not sure we're gonna get into right now, but a lot of features that are are in ERP nowadays to support that type of manufacturing. Yeah. The different the different ways to go. So just like talk that through just really quickly again for people that maybe don't know. So make to stock I think is what especially people that aren't in the business think all manufacturers do, which is like I just yeah. keep making some stuff, right. put it in a building or a closet or whatever yeah. until somebody needs it. But right. that isn't really how we do it anymore. Right. So like a make to stock, as you mentioned, if I'm I'm I'm, I'm Beck or Gillette, I make races all the time, right? I'm making those a stock, distribute them off the shelves. Um, if I'm make to order, um, typically make into, uh, you know, a customer's print, whether it's an A and D type customer or, or somebody like that. If I'm assembled to order, I'm usually building, you know, building to a certain level, um, and then adding options to it. Right. 
So that's assembled to order or configured to order. So if you go on a Ford manufacturing site or a Chevy site, you click build my car. Mm. It asks you what options I want to have on it. That's configured to order, right? They're building the car up to a certain stage and they add they add options to it. And then there's engineer to order, which is a lot of folks are around this area are engineer to order. So they're actually either build helping the customer, you know, engineer the the item and then you know, build it, and then they might repeat that. So aerospace and defense, capital equipment, a lot of times they're engineered to order type manu- manufacturing. Um, and you mentioned, you know, what else has changed? You know, technology has changed too. So, you know, business intelligence has been a big thing for the last few years, but now we got a digital transformation over the last 10 years, um, low code, you know, platforms that are in the ERP. So if you want to extend it or be more interoperable, that's mm-hmm. the right word. Yeah. Um, you certainly can can do that with your ERPs today, which was difficult over the last, you know, twenty years. Um, and then there's there's other tools where you can tie into like best of breed solutions for, you know, IoT, you know, tying into your machines and the shop floor, the capital equipment, that kind of thing. So a lot of new features in yeah, no the kidding. ERP the last few and, years. And so like yeah. sounds like there's gotta be so yeah. if I'm I'm thinking about the ERP world, right? You you've got all these different stuff, right? Sort of make to make to stock, make to order, engineer to order, customer, right? all that different stuff. So ERP is gonna help me in any of those scenarios, right? Right. Yeah. So so yep. why I mean you talked about before and I alluded to it, it just feels like you always talk to people and they are never fully satisfied with their ERP implementation. Yeah. I wonder from your vantage point, why is that? Like why, why is there such a, for something that when you, when you sort of list it out, right, we talked about the value you could bring when it seems like something so obvious that you really, really need, right? I mean, just talking about multivariant analysis, it's impossible to just keep track of all my materials on paper, mm-hmm. let alone trying to figure out all the inputs and the costing and the da, 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 right. da, da. And then you got billing and sales tracking. So you, it makes sense to put it all together, but yet, despite this like macro, this seems so obvious at the at the individual micro level, everyone's dissatisfied. Why? Right. So I was looking at this post on um, Vistage, which is a you know leadership you know organization yeah, business group, business yeah. group. Mm-hmm. and uh, one of the people were writing, "I'm looking for a new ERP, but I don't want to implement it because I'd rather stab my eyeballs out." Right. <laughs> that was the comment they mentioned. So I get what you're saying. It's not. It's not something you do unless you have to do it, right? Yeah, I mean, they're they're not the only person that's thought, I'd rather put a hot poker in my eye than go through another ERP implementation, even though I'm not satisfied. But I I don't get it. Why? What's the big challenge? So when you ask me, you know, what, what we, why do we do the thing we do is we don't want people to stab their eyes in the sky. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't want a lot of blind people in right. manufacturing. Yeah. So why does it happen? I think there's about, there's five key reasons I think it happens. So one is around people, two is around executive sponsorship, um, three is around scope creep, which we can get into. Um, four is around, you know, change management and five is really around, there's a lot, there's thousands of ERPs out there. And people usually shortlist down to two. And the reason why is because each ERP is built for a specific industry, right? So you want to make sure you have the right ERP, just not the ERP a certain vendor or publisher is trying to sell you, right? So those are the five reasons why I think ERPs um, projects might not provide the results that you originally, the company that bought it originally intended to have. So I'll start with the right uh, people. So, you know, our company, the right people, meaning in the decision making process, we're saying both the right okay. people in the decision, but they're also the right partner. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have about a hundred consultants and every day they go into companies that are, you know, manufacturing. So we've got job shops, aerospace and defense, capital equipment, the list goes on, but they love manufacturing. They have a passion for manufacturing. Like we talked about, they understand they've been with us for about 15 years. So they've seen all the best practices and all the unique requirements that different companies have. Um, Then you have that big team around you. So if you run into something that you personally haven't seen, you can look into our best practices, you know, knowledge base, but also ask your colleagues over our internal channels and communication. So we, we always get an answer for our customers that is a best practice, right? So I kind of, one of our um, people on our team makes the analogy that you can, you can be a decent golfer, and if you want to improve at golf, it, you can go out and buy new golf clubs. But those new golf clubs aren't going to make you shoot a lot better, right, without having a good coach. So we think of ourselves as a coach, a trusted advisor, 
And you want to have that right partner that has those best practices that can be that coach versus just buying an ERP and buying the ERP alone is not going to make you shoot par. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it really requires that right team behind you that has experience with thousands of customers, uh, many case studies around that, and has that, you know, a large enough um, knowledge base uh, and passion for manufacturing specifically. So, that's so sort of the not so like the, on the people side going off is like making sure I got the right people in place to make this thing happen. And yeah. and it sounds like the corollary to that is if I just sort of take my production manager and be like, hey, in your spare time, get this ERP implemented. Yeah, it's going to be a struggle. It is. Okay. Yeah. So that's problem number one. So got to get the right people on the team. Yep. That that's a business one hundred and one. Got it. What was yep. the second point? So yep, the right advisor, right coach. Um, that that's seen those things. And the second one is executive sponsorship. So we're in alignment with your key stakeholders and the and and everybody in the company to the same common goal, same vision. So if you're implementing this to to be more efficient, so you can grow. Um, and you want to maybe improve your on-time delivery at the same time reducing lead time, for example, that's the goal of the project. And as ex executive sponsorship, you want to make sure that the executive stays committed throughout the whole project that we're going to get this done. Because what happens is it's a lot of, you have your day job, everybody has their day job, everybody's busy, everybody's running lean. Um, they don't have as many people as they like to hire. It's hard to hi hire right now. So um, it's, it's really hard to to give up all that time it takes to implement an ERP because it is a project, right? So executive being committed to it, constantly checking in with the team, maybe even using itself and being in those, you know, stakeholder meetings every every week or every other week during the project and keep keep aligning why we're doing this and cheering on the wins that we're making over time. So, you know, you hear the thing that when people do change in projects, I commonly hear well, I want to do it this way because that's how we've always done it. But in a project like this, you have to be creative. You have to be innovative. You have to be willing to change. And the executive is very, and the, and the stake, key stakeholder team is very important um, to do that, cheer on uh, wins, make sure that they're communicating why we're changing. And that that's another key that sometimes doesn't happen because executives are busy just like everybody else. So that's one of the, the other things that we see sometimes is that you really need to have that executive commitment, that commitment to change, and uh, keep aligning that vision of why we're doing this project. Do you find that like the executives lose interest, or what? Like, kind of what happens? They feel like it just runs on autopilot because you you brought up a couple key items there, so I'll I'll put them back one by one. But just talk to me about that. What happens typically? Yeah, so it so usually there's a, a key stakeholder team. So what I mean by that is you have somebody from sales and estimating mm -hmm. um, that's in the project. Then you have somebody from production that's in the pro that's a key stakeholder, operations or production. And then you're gonna have somebody from quality, somebody from finance, obviously. So you have all the, and there's other, other folks. Yeah, don't forget IT, come on, IT, don't leave us out cold. Yeah. IT is very important in that as well, so thank you. But yeah, you have this team, team that comes together and they're really doing the day to day. You know, so they have their day jobs, they're working maybe six hours a day you know, doing what they do to run their business. And then they have two hours a day during this project, one to two hours a day during this project that they're giving up to implement the ERP. So they're the ones that are doing that every day and the executive doesn't have, always have the time to do that. So sometimes they might, you know, be involved in the decision of to buy the ERP, set out the goals, but sometimes they get so busy that they're not in the stakeholder meeting every week. And we find that's really important for that executive to be there and to keep hammering that drum beat. This, we're gonna get this done and, and here's why we're doing it and here's why we're changing, here's our goals at the end and keep that you know, vision aligned across six people because if you have one of those stakeholders or somebody that's getting trained saying, this might be a little bit different than what I'm used to, so I'm gonna go back to doing how I used to do it. Mm. You, that's that's, what that, the, right. that's one domino and then it right, starts, exactly. got it. All right, yep. cool. So let's keep going. Yep. yep. So the third one is is really scope creep, and scope creep can happen in in the project, or it can happen when you're selecting an ERP. So if you've if you've gone through a demo of software before any software, <laughs> right, you know that the salespeople are going to talk to you, and you're probably looking at three, at least three ERP publishers, right? 
So you're hearing all their bells and whistles. And now when you started the project, you said, we want to be more efficient. We want to get that scheduling better, whatever the goals of your project are, right? And then all of a sudden there's all these new goals because you've learned all the things <laughs> the software um, can do. And you know what, what happens there is the project keeps growing and growing and growing. And we, we work with small, medium-sized manufacturing companies. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with companies that are, you know, is, you know, around 5 million, typically to about 125 million. We have companies that are billion dollar in size because they grew with us and scaled. But that's where we usually start with a company that comes to look, look at us to implement or select an ERP. Um, so we try to implement the software in, you know, four to seven months. Whereas somebody like a lot of the tier tier two or high, bigger tier two or tier one ERPs could be multi-year projects, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're introducing all that scope creep because either you have a new idea in the middle of the project or you learn something that may not be the original uh, thing, you're adding more training, more processes that you have to look at and, um, and consider, and that makes that project longer. And as we talked about, these most small medium businesses, they have a lean team. They don't have a, 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 um, a lot of time because they're making their, they're doing their day job. So when you introduce all this new, new functionality and all these new ideas, which is great, um, you sometimes make that project longer. And then when you learn something day one or week one or week two in the project, and now you're going live at week eight because the project's got longer, you might have forgotten that. Mm. So really looking at what is important for us as a company and why we started this project and doing that in phase one, and then you have continuous improvement opportunities every quarter. We, we like to say, keep that key stakeholder team to be your continuous improvement team. So we go live um, with the ERP. We can, every quarter we can say, we're gonna add this functionality for this reason because it's gonna improve this and keep doing continuous improvement. That way um, you're always improving, you're doing continuous improvement, but you get that project done quickly you go live with the reason why you went wanted to do the project. Um, and get that, get yes. that ROI get instead that of ROI. being stuck in like exactly. never ending deployments. Exactly. Uh, by the way, a lot of people listening are thinking to themselves, oh, that's a mistake I could have avoided. <laughs> right. um, yeah, yeah, cool. All right, let's keep going. Yep. So we got scope creep. Got to keep yep. that, manage that scope. That makes sense. Yep. So, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the last one, which is working. Um, we talked about a little bit more, but making sure you're going with a system that's built for your company. A lot of ERPs started as financial application packages, and then they said, okay, how can we get more companies to buy our software, right? So what they do, they add manufacturing on, but it was a little bit of an afterthought, mm -hmm. right? So you want to look at systems that were developed specifically for your type of manufacturing. Um, and, and I like to call some of the systems out there vanilla ERP, uh, meaning that they're just made for everyone. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you want to find what's, what's really going to work, um, for your, for your company. And that mistake could happen in the selection process. And then you realize the demo looked great. The technology looked great. The screens looked really easy, but did it have the functionality to meet your core, you know, business results? So, you know, when, a recommendation I'd have for those that are listening is really talk about why you're doing this project, what makes you guys, what your company unique, what are the wins and KPIs you wanna change out of this, right? And focus the, the um, selection process on that because every, every ERP system can do a trial balance. Every ERP system yeah, yeah, can yeah. do order entry. So focus on really what's going to help your company. And every grow. ERP can do a really sexy looking demo too. So exactly. that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. so it's funny, right? There's just, you know, in some ways I feel like buying software is buying software. So we deal with a lot of the same issues. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to kind of go back and pull on some of these threads a little bit and hopefully yeah. get some lessons learned. So, you know, one thing is talking about understanding the goals. It, it's so, I, I think companies can find it really difficult mm -hmm. to determine, I don't know what I don't know. What should right. my goals be? And then which ones are important, which ones should I start with first, right? So so I think some people start the process by going, well, I know I need something, so why don't I go do some demos, see what people offer, and then decide which one I like best that way. But you're sort of saying, no, you got to know the goal before you go in, totally makes sense. Yep. 
but how do you do it? Like, how, you know, how do you sit down and determine what the goal should be? Right. So it's usually usually when people start thinking they need an ERP is that they've grown so much. They have all these different system, Excel spreadsheets, manual, other manual systems, four pieces of software. Maybe it's a project management tool like um, Trello or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they have other systems and it gets it starts to be really cumbersome to try to interlinked Excel yeah, spreadsheets. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So one of the main reasons that they think about getting ERP is to be more efficient and not have all these systems that don't talk to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a goal that almost everybody has when they go to ERP is to become more efficient, to have all my data in one place, not having to rekey data into multiple systems. Right. So getting that efficiency. We have a co company up in Air, Massachusetts. That's a they're a great customer, Accurounds, and they they actually sit on um, the board that advises the last three presidents about manufacturing in the U.S. Mike Tomasi, he's the owner, great guy. Um, but the reason why I mentioned them is that when they originally bought the ERP, it was to be more efficient, and they've grown from a four million dollar company now they're over thirty million dollars, and they still have one person in finance with all that growth, right? So that's what I mean by being able to grow and be more efficiency, efficient because you have everything in, in that one system and it makes it easier. So if you started with that, though, you, so you, I, you made that point, and for sure we see this all the time, right? Yeah. You've got five, six, seven, eight, whatever systems. They don't talk to each other. So you just got to pick which ones you want to start replacing first and just get that done and then move to the next one? Absolutely. So that's part of it. And the other thing is usually you're looking at what your customers want as well. So our customers, cust you know, customers, the manufacturing telling, customer. yeah, 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 they're telling them what they need, whether it's, you know, we go back to that price delivery quality, right? Mm -hmm. So usually the goals and why they change, want to change comes from, you know, being strategic and how they can better provide a better experience for their customers, whether it's delivering faster, delivering with, um, you know, less cost if they need to, you know, change things, mm -hmm. um, or or maybe it's quality or compliance that their their customers need. Like a aerospace and defense, they have serialization and and lot trace and AS ninety one hundred two requirements that they might have to pass on. So can the system help change in that way? So that might be a goal they they might have. Um, and then a lot of times people also change because they've either been recently acquired or there's an investment from a PE company or something of that nature. Um, and they're being told, hey, you gotta have better data. You gotta data. get better you systems. You gotta have better data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, So yeah. where's your dashboards? Where's your things like that? So really it's based on the business strategy and what the, where they wanna go to is efficiency, but also that PDQ, the data. That's usually the areas that we see people wanting to, to change. So on. let's say we make the decision. We, mm -hmm. we, we got our priorities straight. We said this is our number one priority. We're going to go focus on that. Um, and then, you know, there's, then you got to decide up front which system is going to get my short term goal done, but also how's it going to serve my long term goals. Right. And is right. that where picking an ERP that's like really designed to work for my industry is so important because they'll most likely be aligned with me as I get down the road? Absolutely. So you, you want to look at growth, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen in five years. You might buy another company. Right. Maybe you're single site right now. In five years from now, you could be multi-site. That ERP better be able to do multi-site financials, multi-site operations, uh, that kind of thing. So good point. I think the other thing is what, what we feel, and of course, I'm a little bit biased, right? But um, we get back to that people thing, the right partner. Um, so when, when you're looking at the software and the, and the partner, I think they're both just as important. So what partner can be there for the long term that's gonna have all that expertise in house? You know, our, our consultants have 15 years of experience um, on average in manufacturing. Many of them were COOs in a manufacturing plant, VP of operations. A um, couple of our folks are Six Sigma black belts um, on, you know, lean. They have. Jonas from the Goldrat Institute. So if you read the book, The Goal mm -hmm. by Ellie Goldrat, um, they, they do um, a different, you know, theory constraints type scheduling. Mm -hmm. So we have expertise in that. Um, so just making sure you have that right partner and software that's going to be there five years for, for five years from now, 10 years from now, where you want to grow, because you don't want to be stabbing your your eye out every every, every five years. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. uh, so, so what about like time allocation? Because you yeah. talked about sort of time allocation. So should I be thinking, hey, if I'm going to do this project, I got to look at these people that are going to be on the steering committee and possibly in the areas that are going to be impacted by a change of process and sort of understand that for some period of time, I got to 
I got to either figure out adding in overtime costs or allocate some percentage of their day to go just to this process. Because the, there's just no, it doesn't seem to me, maybe it's possible, you tell me, but it doesn't seem likely that I'm going to be able to roll this out and not have any impact on people's like work schedule. It's the unfortunate truth. That's part of the stabbing of the eyes, right? Right. So is you're, and the whole project might take four to seven months like we talked about. And it's not every day that you're giving up an hour or two. It might be, you know, in the first phase of the project is usually looking at your current state process, right? So that might be two or three days of really mapping out your your current state, really understanding it. And then the next week, you're gonna probably go through two weeks of configuration and saying, here's how we're setting up the system. Here's gonna be your future state processes. And then it might be a couple of weeks that go by because you're looking at um, training one person in the company and not everybody else is gonna have to be involved that day. Right, so it, it ebbs and flows, the, the amount of work that each person on that steering committee, the, the key stakeholders mm -hmm. um, have to give. But there is certainly um, time that they're giving up, they're, they're adding to their, to their, day. their I mean, day job. So, so yeah. for, for companies that are already sort of doing yep. lean and they maybe have Kaizen events or they do sort of those like continuous improvement huddles mm -hmm. where like on a weekly basis, each individual cell or group of area gets together and looks at sort of continuous improvement opportunities. Do you find that people can just say, well, you know what, we're already committing X number of hours a week or whatever it is to that. What if we, for the next four or five months, we don't do that and we yep. focus those times on like ERP deployment so so we can sort of reallocate time? I mean, is that something that works? You see people doing absolutely. that? Absolutely. We, we absolutely do. The one thing that, and that's exactly typically how it works, the one thing that we do see is in, a, in an ERP implementation, what we recommend is that we'll have, or whoever partner you choose, any any good ERP partner that you choose is going to have their own project coordinator or project manager. But you want to have somebody internally that can also be the project coordinator that's pushing the project um, forward internally and, and has the respect of the people in the team or um, the executive uh, aura to, to get mm -hmm. the, the project to keep moving forward. So having that internal project coordinator that is probably spending a little bit more time, maybe 40, 50 percent of their time per week is going to that ERP project. Whereas, like you said, the rest of the people on the on the key stakeholder, the steering committee, they're usually, you know, putting something else that they're doing right now aside and putting the ERP project as a priority. Yeah, reallocating right. project time. Yeah. So if you're going to continually be if you're going to be continually adding functionality and features to ERP for theoretically forever, does that mean that this person internally champion needs to be thinking about allocating 40, 50% of their time forever? Like, is that a role you would recommend people have at a certain size as somebody to sort of champion that on a sort of forever basis? Um, typically when, when there's new features that come out, it's, it's not as big of a project as the original implementation. So it goes back to that kind of that, that stakeholder team that was involved in the project. And those who might, come in and out over time because not everybody stays at the mm. company they're with forever. <laughs> right. um, but you have that key stakeholder team that becomes your continuous improvement team. And that project coord you know, coordinator or project manager that's internal usually stays on that stakeholder team. And the, and the group decides based on the strategy and what they want to do as a company, what's the next thing we want to implement? But it's not... It's 40, not going to be nearly as, not, as much time. Not nearly. It's, so, I mean, yeah. thinking about sort of... Yeah. We're going to take a turn and come back, but you know, thinking about managing it over the long haul... You know, at what point does it make sense to have somebody who's sort of dedicated to just sort of being in the in the ERP? Maybe it's not project management, but yep. it seems to me like I'm always hearing about, oh, there's someone can someone generate a new report or can we change the order screen or can we add something to the track, you know, to the to the track or whatever, you know, a traveler, you know, whatever it is. But there's right. just seems like there's always something changing. Is there is I mean, do you say at some point, hey, when you get to this size, you should have somebody who's sort of dedicated to running this software? Does that never happen? Kind of what's the and that gets, that's a good question. So that gets back to the right ERP for the right size company. So we've, we've been in a company where they only have four people in the front office, 20 people on the shop floor. They're a, a small company. They cannot afford to have a dedicated person managing ERP. So yeah, they just need probably a also don't really need it, right? right? I mean, a, a system that just works, right? Right, right, right. So right, right. it really depends on the size of company you are. And the bigger, bigger you are, the more, more things you might need to, to do. Um, so at that point, you probably have somebody that's, that is the ERP power user. Um, that typically, that's somebody that's in a finance role or in an IT role, like you mentioned, that's doing that. Uh, and that's, you mentioned before, and you asked the question, what's changed in ERP over the last 20 years? One of the things is 
you know, do you want to be managing everything in that server room yourself, right? So if you're managing the server, you're managing compliance, you're managing security, and, you only have, and you're only a company that's a big enough to have one IT person, that gets really difficult to have that same IT person creating new reports, creating new workflows, and, you know. It's also it, totally different skills. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and generally. A podiatrist isn't going to yes. give you heart surgery, but they're both <laughs> right. doctors, yeah. Exactly, very totally different skills. So you do want somebody that is um, an ERP power user, but you also want to make sure it's you're not just having all that tribal knowledge of the system in one person either. So right, so right. you got back and forth. Yes. So yeah. let, let me ask you this question, sort of the age-old question, I think, that, that yeah. people often, I think, get wrong, but interested in your take on it, you've seen a lot more than I have, is they try and bend the ERP to their will. Right. And instead of sort of like more going with the flow, yep. I've seen dozens of companies regret that decision. But it is always like a balance, right? I mean, you don't want to just uh, tell the ERP to, you know, software people to revamp your whole way your whole company works, but yet at the same time. So how do you how do you think about that balance of going with the flow, what the system does, and then making the system custom to the way the company works? Yeah, it's a great question. And you're you're in an age where most of these newer ERP systems, they're very flexible. So you can really do whatever you want. With well, them. that's that's right. what that's what that's what software sales is the best at. Well, tell me what you want. You want it tall? I'll make it yeah. tall. You want it short? I'll make it short. Yep. Stout, skinny, like up, down, whatever. It, it can do any. Yeah, the software it, could do anything. Yeah. It can do anything. But sure. the, the question is, do you want to be managing that customization, or do you want to be making parts for your customers? Right. That's good. <laughs> it's a really good simple yeah. question. Yeah. Right. Do you want to be managing the customizations or making parts for your customers? Yeah. Right. So if there's something that's really unique to your company, you want that flexibility. But for the most part, if you find the right ERP for your business and you've and you can put your processes that are gonna meet your goals, you can typically use the core ERP workflows and, and functionality. Um, and then there's things in ERP where you can create, you can change the workflows a little bit, which isn't touching code. So those survive upgrades. You don't have to manage them, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then if you have something really unique about your company, you can use that flexibility. Or if you want to, you know, be tie your ERP into some best of breed solution for like supplier portals or um, shop floor Internet of Things, um, like a machine metrics type thing, you can still do that. But now you're up. You know, you're you're not touching the core functionality, the ERP. You're just extending it with the APIs, right? So that allows you to do upgrades without having to go back and re, you know, develop those customizations. And you're not managing, like we talked about. You're focusing on on the business. So there's a there's a debate out there. You know, should we have an ERP that can do everything for our company, um, and and have a great ERP that can touch everything and just use it all? Or should we be able to use best of breed, you know, solutions like CRM, for example, Salesforce.com or Zoho or Sugar CRM? All they do is, I mean, all day long is focus on CRM. Well, if you have an ERP vendor that's making great scheduling, great supply chain and inventory management tools, costing tools, they might not build the best CRM. So being able to have that extensibility where you can, you know, have bi-directional data flow between your CRM, like Salesforce, or Zoho and the ERP is important, but the thing that's important to note is that when you upgrade or the if you're in the cloud and the, it automatically updates you to a new feature or version, that fun, that extensibility still works with the tools that are in ERPs nowadays. You don't have to redevelop that. You don't. Right? Yeah. Is that pretty common? Is that what you could talk about low code before yep. uh, for ERP expansion? So maybe it's a good opportunity to sort of talk about that. So right. is that, I mean, is that extensibility part of this low code feature that we're talking about? It is. So. Even, um, you know, we, we at Synergy, we don't just represent one ERP because we know that not every manufacturer fits in just one ERP. Um, so we represent three different ones, and one's an on-premise solution that we've been with for 27 years since we started, and people have a passion for it. Um, and two of them are newer multi-tenant cloud applications. So with the, the um, on-premise, it still has open APIs. It has software development kits and it, you can still do those things and but the upgrades don't happen automatically behind the scenes in the multi-tenant cloud this there's, there's a upgrade sure you know over a weekend that gets planning for a few weeks before it or a month before it it's still a an event mm -hmm. right 
Um, but with those APIs, you still don't have to recode anything. The, the, the um, development sits outside the core ERP. You're not touching the source code. Right. So that, so that, so those, so, so those so updates still, still work. We don't run right. into like field mapping issues. Like yeah. everyone, everyone who's had an ERP yeah. and has ever integrated to something yeah. else knows. Like as soon as you run that update, yeah. every connection breaks, and you don't even realize it for like a month. Right. Yeah, yeah, and 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 there are still. I mean, if the ERP changes drastically, in the tables behind the scenes, there might be some things that you have to tweak on the on-premise one. But by and large, you don't have to. So, I mean, you want to make people, you, going back to sort of the big picture, you want to make yep. people happy. So you get into some, we talk to somebody and they're not happy with the, their ERP, right? How often is that unhappiness, can, can it be fixed with just changing how they're using it versus they need a different system? And I, I know that's a hard question to answer because the answer is I'm sure it depends, but maybe you could help the audience like understand what are some of the markers where if you're experiencing this, you should think about a new product, whereas if you're experiencing that, then probably it's just a revamp of your deployment gets you home. Yeah, I'd say almost 80% of the time that we go into a company that um, is having issues, and not even our customers that are having issues with ERP, they could probably do a lot better on the current ERP system they're on. Um, and a lot of times, I call it ERP erosion. Um, okay. So... ERP erosion happens for a lot of different reasons. The person that originally, the team that originally selected the erosion, system. Erosion meaning erosion of the value, erosion of the erosion happiness. Of internal knowledge of okay. how the ERP runs. So they they might not have the same people that chose the ERP and, and implemented it originally, and all that tribal knowledge might not be there anymore. Or they've changed the way they are as a company. They might have new product lines, new ways they manufacture, and they haven't changed their processes of how they use the ERP. Um, or what we talked about in the original implementation or shortly after they went back to going to spreadsheets, right? You hear that all the time, right? right. We spent all this money and we're yeah. still on those old spreadsheets we were yeah. using before it started. Right. Yeah. And that might be because they had a, everything else and the implementation was going well, except for this thing and they stay in the spreadsheet. But now over time they've gotten really unhappy because that's a big part of their business. What's <laughs> in the spreadsheet, right? So then they say, I need a new system, but it could be this change management that, didn't happen at that time or didn't have time to do it. So that's uh, that's a great question. That's one of the reasons we've actually started a couple of years ago our Center of Excellence, which is a team of ERP agnostic um, business process improvement specialists um, that can go into any company and look at that current state, do those Kaizen events that you were talking about. Um, they're not just, um, you know, know how to tell you how to use the ERP in a certain way. They know how to do change management. They're, they actually, we have, we do, we're DISC certified, so the DISC evaluation system. So to help with change management, um, and then they can provide, hey, here's, here's why you're struggling with this, and here's what your current process is, here's what the new process could look like, going through like a value stream, opportunities for automation, why you can do this now in the core ERP, where maybe 10 years ago with the functionality that was there, you had to go to a spreadsheet and really get you to use the ERP as it's meant to be used versus having to go through a whole new oh, ERP. That's another really interesting, uh, really yeah. interesting thing I hadn't thought about, which is we're doing it in the spreadsheet because the system couldn't do it. Yep. And no one's ever gone uh, no one's ever gone back to find out, right. does that actually exist today? And right. the, the, we're still in the spreadsheets for all the wrong reasons. Right. I mean, so it sounds like from your perspective, a view coming in, someone coming in and just taking a step back, if you're not happy, yeah. the best thing to do is like take a step back and, and maybe engage with someone who understands this, either this specific ERP a little bit better or just understand sort of leveraging ERP generally better. Right. Have them come in and look at it and help you understand, like, is this salvageable or is it not salvageable? And I mean, I, I don't know if, you know, it sounds from what you said, the vast majority of the time, it's probably salvageable. And so you should yep. really go through that exercise before you just decide to, like, go through all the pain of an entire new system change. Because if yeah. the reason my system didn't succeed is I'm not allocating the right time, I don't have the right champions, I don't have the right continuous improvement yeah. group, a new system's not going to solve that problem. Uh, exactly. You said it, said it well, right? Yeah. So, and that's, that's really why we went with that center of excellence is a lot of times people will hire like um, lean experts that come in and, and they might not know the ERP, right? or they hire ERP experts and they might not know the best manufacturing, lean processes, et cetera. I'm just using lean as an example, right? right? So to marry those two things together um, and, and digitize 
you know, lean, for example, as well as make sure you have the right processes going forward, um, you can usually get what you want out of the, the current system. But then you also might find out that you can't, right? <laughs> so those best practices might say, hey, you can't even do that in the ERP you have. So then it might be, is it a decision that it would be worthwhile moving to another ERP? Right, but at least right? then you know, right? So like yeah. take the time to to figure that out. And if right. you're frustrated, it sounds like the number one thing is take some action. Yes. Right, because yeah. it ain't going to get better by itself. Exactly. Uh, the thing isn't going to miraculously yeah. Yeah. sort of get there. So, I mean... So th this has been awesome, Paul. I really appreciate it. I think a lot of people listening hopefully got a lot out of that because um, we really hit on some really important, uh, you know, kind of keep points of what you need to kind of manage it, deliver it, you know, and do all yep. that. Sort of what's what's next on the technology innovation from a, from an IT standpoint from your seat for manufacturers? Is it just more kind of in the ERP? Is it using that software better? Mm -hmm. Are there like new things coming? Like, you know, what, what do you see from your vantage point? You know, if, if I'm, let's say I'm, I'm right now, I'm listening. I'm like, listen, this is cool, but I'm really happy. I've done all this stuff. I'm really yeah. cool with what I have. I want to be, I want to be moving to the next stage, right? I want to stay ahead and, right. you know, particularly in the Northeast, that's super important, right? We need to leverage technology as best we can. What's next? Yeah, so I mean, cloud, we've, we've all heard of cloud, right? So 20 years ago, CRM moved to the cloud, and then almost all software is going to the cloud, right? So the cloud is one option that's out there is, do you want to be in the cloud? Um, the thing to be careful there is, you know, a lot of these newer cloud applications, they haven't had the 20, the 30 years mm -hmm. to put all that manufacturing functionality in it. Um, so they really did focus on the financials. So you got to make sure that if you go to a cloud software, it, it has the right things. But that cloud does allow you to, you know, not have to focus on um, everything, or they could use an MSP like sure. like you, right? So um, with their current on-premise to, to do that. So cloud is one thing that we see. LCAP, which is that low-code application platform, um, that can be really powerful. We, we talked about the... So give some examples of where you could yeah. use um, LCAP. And, and I don't want to just jump over the cloud because I know that, so I, yeah. I maybe just sort of move past it. But yeah, I totally get it. And I think, you know, there's lots of different ways where cloud can be valuable, right? Sort of extracting out of, especially if you're multi-location. Right. Um, and you could do cloud a number of different ways, right? You could take your yeah. own stuff that you have right now and move it to a data center. You could right. do it that way or go to a cloud app. So um, all that cool stuff. Talk about the LCAP and... and like, give me some examples of how people are using that. Yep. So it, it, it can, I'll go back to like something that all of us can relate to. So we all have either an iPhone or an Android phone, right? And you might set up an appointment in Outlook and you put the address of where that appointment, like when I came here today, I did that. So I get in the car and I don't want to have, I don't remember the addresses. So I go into my, on CarPlay, I go in and I click on the appointment and it opens up Apple with the address already in there. So I just made two different applications, my Outlook, my, my Outlook app on my phone or my mail app on my phone and Google Maps or Apple all work together. Right? In your car system. In the car system, right? So it all works together, right? So I'm not rekeying information. And that's where, you know, the LCAP, you know, can come in. It, it allows you to extend the functionality of the ERP for those unique requirements, but it also allows you to um, interoperability with other applications that you might still want to use. Um, CAD systems, right? ERP is not getting rid of your CAD software. So do we want the CAD system to talk to the ERP so you don't have to re-enter the bill of materials and fat finger something and then order the wrong part that's a 26 week lead time and then scrap <laughs> it, right? You don't want to do things like that. So being able to have that interoperability is what the LCAP does, but it, it also stands for low code, meaning you don't have to have developers that are deep developers on staff, typically. So you can um, do this extensibility and do this, you know, changes to the system to make it a little bit unique for you without having to have a team of developers on staff. So that's what LCAP stands for, and that's that interoperability. And those are a couple of the examples of what um, low code and That's pretty, and are we seeing a lot more expansion in that sort of LCAP capability? Yeah, uh, and more yeah. more abilities to connect, right? Because because cl clearly you didn't program your Outlook app to connect to your mail to come, right? So so it's sort of a little I bit wish of relying. I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of relying yeah. on the vendors. Are you seeing a lot more interoperability kind of coming out? Because I mean that's, I mean for people that are listening, you know that, that's some, that's some pretty cool shit to be honest. Absolutely. So we're seeing things like 
Microsoft Teams, right? Over the last few years in the pandemic, people started using Zoom Teams more than they used to. Like we used to use GoToMeeting and way WebEx more. Yeah, 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 10 way years more. ago, but it's been, it's almost every company uses it now. So imagine sitting inside your ERP and you want to talk to, and you're looking at the sales order entry and you forgot to ask a question. So you click on the contact name, it automatically calls through Teams without having to pick up your phone. That's an example of interoperability we're seeing in ERPs these days, just that. Or um, we talked about the CAD thing, supplier performance, right? And supply chain has been a big need over the last three years um, with the, the, the pandemic and what's happened with the, the supply chain. So without a supplier portal, what you're doing typically is you take the purchase order or you, you place the purchase order in your ERP system, then you send a bunch of emails, a bunch of phone calls, a bunch of sticky notes on your monitor of what to follow up on and what they told you. So supplier portal, you put the PO in, it automatically shows up on a, a portal. The supplier gets an alert, they log in, they say, oh, they reply to it, yes, I can deliver on time, yes, that's the right price, and yes, I, I confirm that I got this PO. No need to make any phone calls, emails, follow up on the phone calls if somebody didn't answer. So that's an example of interoperability that, you know, through using the, you know, a Extent. portal yeah. and extension. And another good one is we talked about a couple of times, IOT, right? Internet of things. So the machines in the shop floor, if, if you're, if you have a lot of screw machines or something of that nature, you can, you can connect the, um, the machine metrics, for example, is one of our partners. You can connect that, um, to the, to the ERP. So what does that mean? I have this internet of things that's tracking my downtime reasons in real time. It's tracking are my, my spindles on my CNC machines running at optimum speed? Did they slow down? Am I, am I in a setup so you can get your OEE out of it and, and see what your capacity is where, versus where it really could be with the same equipment without having to buy another million dollar machine or 500K machine? But then what you're doing is you're working between two different systems, right? You have to go into the ERP to see what job should I work on next potentially right. or a spreadsheet if you're still <laughs> using a spreadsheet, right? And then, and then when you actually do the work, you have to go back into the ERP and create a labor ticket either by clocking in and out of it on the system or doing it manually. So by able to connect those two things together, the IOT tool and the ERP, the ERP can send the job you should work next in there or the IOT solution like machine metrics based on the CNC program that's loaded on the machine at the time can know what work orders there <laughs> and can send back the information, the labor tickets right into the ERP. So you get your costing, you get your schedule updated, you get your status of your jobs updated and you get your OEE and um, opportunities for continuous improvement. How can I look at my downtime in a Pareto chart and see where is my opportunities to improve? How can I get more capacity on mach my machines? And we had a customer that got they told us they got two and a half million dollars more capacity without buying another machine by using these type of interoperability things. And is this like pretty commonly available stuff, you know, that it's just a matter of kind of know how to connect it, or is this is this kind of whiz bang that only a few systems can do? Um it it's it's really having a partner that, you know, knows how to put it together. You you have, you know, the IoT companies, you have the Supply ch supplier portal companies, unless it's in some of our ERPs have that in there already without having to go to an outside service, but a partner that can be an advisor on, hey, make them work together. And outside of the center of excellence, one thing we're really proud of is we are big enough that we took a couple of our, you know, technology bright minds off of billable consulting and we started an innovation center a couple of years ago. So all they do is listen to customers' needs what do they want? And if we think that more than one customer wants it, we start building it before the fact. So an example of that is Zoho CRM, right? Some of our smaller customers can't afford Salesforce, right? So they have Zoho CRM, but they don't want to have to put all the information into Zoho and, and then the double ERP it, yeah, and sure, then bi-directional. Sure. So we've invested in, and we have the technology in our ERPs to have that, you know, that it used to be called middleware. Yep. But now the data just goes back and forth, flows in an, an iPass type solution, um, goes back and forth. And we d developed all this so our customers. So it's not a direct API that. that is already integrated. There is some middleware basically in there that's helping do the conversion. We have both options. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sometimes the iPass is easy because you can build that connection to, you know, one ERP or one CRM. And then when you want a new CRM comes along, you just. Feed change it one side. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 
So yeah. there's just a lot of exciting stuff that I think people could get uh, yeah. could get from all that if they just took a step back and looked at it and said, "What more can I do with what I already have?" Absolutely, yeah. Dude, that's uh, that's yeah. pretty awesome, man. It sounds like uh, sounds like you, we've been able to make some happy customers and people have an opportunity to be happier with the area P if they just put some time into it. Yeah, I mean, I. I I love waking up in the morning and just like everybody nowadays, right, is we want to have a mission, right? So if we can help manufacturing companies in the U.S. improve improve the economy, um, make friends while we do it, because we, we we work closely with these folks. I'm going on vacation in a couple months with one of our cu customers <laughs> right, that I met through this. And that's what I love about this is that the relationships you build through, through helping companies um, meet their goals, right? Dude, amen to that, brother. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move us to rapid fire round of questions. We'll Alrighty. wrap this up. You ready, boss? I'm ready. All right, here we go. I mean, you're a New Hampshire boy, so I think we'll get this one right. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox, that's easy. <laughs> Starbucks <laughs> or Duncan? Uh, Duncan. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Yeah. Sports car or SUV? Sports car. Yeah. Staycation or exotic destination? I love both, actually. Sorry. Oh, no yeah. decision. He's going for the both. <laughs> right. Love it. If you do, you have a favorite business book. Uh, the goal that we mentioned uh, was one that I really like. Um, John Doerr's books, and I'm reading The Radical Edge, but I think his name's Steve Barber right now. That's a that's one that I really enjoyed as well. So, but the goal would be probably my ultimate. Your favorite. Your ultimate favorite. Yeah. That's cool. The Radical Edge. Is that what you said? The Radical Edge. I'll have to check yeah. that one out. Yeah. Um, if you could, if you could do anything, and it had to be something other than being CEO of Synergy Resources, what would you do with your time? Be that race car driver. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Formula One or NASCAR? <laughs> I like both, but just I love speed. So speed, there you yeah, go. The, feeling yeah. the need for speed. Yes. What's something that you learned early in your life, Paula, early in your career uh, that you think has helped propel you to all the success that you've had? I think um, going back to what we talked about earlier was, you know, putting myself through college, um, having to have a couple jobs while being um, in college taught me that. It's, it's a lot about hard work, right? And grit and determination is um, what gets you to where you want to go, right? So um, I, th I think just learning hard work, personal responsibility, being a little bit self-critical, those are the things that I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. You did, yes. absolutely. So, I think those are great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's something that you learned later in your career, later in your life, that if you went back and told young Paul, and if he'd listened to you, it'd have a real positive impact on his life? I think... Um, I mentioned earlier when we, before we started recording that I was, I'm more of an introvert by nature. Um, but, you know, putting yourself out there, I learned later in my career, especially, you know, getting into that VP of sales role, um, getting into the CEO role, you, you really got to put yourself out there and um, not be afraid of what other people think of you, but also live by the golden rule, right? Do unto others as they want you to do to them, right? So I think putting yourself out there is something that I've learned later in life that I wish I'd no started doing before. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Dude, those are some, uh, speaking of golden rule, those are some golden nuggets, man. Yes. Paul, I really appreciate uh, you coming on and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Ari. I really appreciate you having me. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community and it would be impossible to do without all of you.